This episode is brought to you by Chris Salee, your local health markets insurance agency. Creative solutions for your health, Medicare, and life insurance needs. Personalized advice at 503-678-5768. This episode is also brought to you by Oddmo's Pizza in Canby. Handmade awesome pizza plus craft beer, wine, and cider delivered. Call them today at 503-263-8444. Welcome to the Canby Now Podcast. Your source for news. The threat of a possible teacher strike was avoided this week. There's a new irresistibly cute creature winning over fans. And its name is Scootaloo. Sports. It's like Lucy in the football. You want to kick a field goal, but they take it away from you. We had to learn how to win. Mm -hmm. Goal can't be in the last second of the game! And interesting conversations. Because I'm one of the strongest girls ever, and I know that for a fact. (laughs) I just really enjoy writing gossip as if I was a bear. (laughs) With an old maid daughter that makes the best moonshine in the coast. (laughs) If it would have hit me in the face, I think I would have died. I really do. It, it, it... I guarantee you would have died, man. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you might want to grab some popcorn for this one. We'll wait. Some back and forth between the chair of Clackamas County Board of Commissioners Jim Bernard and County Sheriff Craig Roberts this past week as the two elected officials traded words over the state of the county's finances and the need for an independent auditor. Sheriff Roberts began with an op-ed Thursday in which he challenged leadership over the county's financial state and how it got there. In the midst of a new messaging campaign about the need to make cuts and right-size the county's budget, Roberts asked, quote, On behalf of our employees and on behalf of the community we serve, I have an obligation to ask. In a robust economy with increasing growth and revenue, how did this financial crisis happen? We need to know why and how the county general fund is reportedly facing an estimated 8 million to 12 million deficit in a time of unprecedented county growth. Roberts says he, along with all county departments, have been asked to prepare budget cut scenarios of 5, 10, and 15 percent, a development he described as astonishing. The county says the budget for its current fiscal year is balanced, which is required by law, but this was accomplished by drawing down one-time reserves that cannot be used again. Meanwhile, the county is looking to build a new $230 million courthouse, which Robert believes will be supplemented from the county general fund if voters turn down a proposed bond measure. Polling shows there is currently inadequate voter support for that general obligation bond. Robert says, Commissioners will almost certainly draw on general fund dollars, the same dollars they're currently asking us to slash from our budgets, to ensure the courthouse's construction. The following day, and again on Saturday, Chair Bernard clapped back, claiming there were several inaccuracies in the sheriff's letter and expressing the need to set the record straight. The county's general fund is not in crisis, he says. There is no mismanagement of public funds. The county has balanced its budget year after year, as is required by state law. He admits the county budget is not on a sustainable path due to expenses outpaying revenues. The county has indeed grown, which has increased revenue, but also demand for services. The chair also says that there have been no decisions made as to how the new courthouse will be funded, and he maintained that the current budget challenges are unrelated to the project. The county is pursuing a new county courthouse at the same time because the state of Oregon is paying half the cost of the new courthouse construction, Bernard said. Leaving these state dollars on the table would be irresponsible when there is a serious need for a new county courthouse for safety and justice reasons. In a more direct post on his political Facebook page Saturday, Bernard challenged the sheriff on his own record of spending, financial accountability, and litigation saying, quote, I have always been a supporter of the sheriff, even when he refused any input on how he spends his money. Because the fact is, once we give it to him, it's gone. He gets 50% of our general fund. 
There are three contract cities that pay him for service and an enhanced law enforcement district. Where's your money going? You can read the complete letters and responses, and seriously, you should. It's some juicy stuff. Or, you know, as juicy as disagreement over financial audits and the management of public funds can be, on our website, canbenowpod.com. The Canby Area Chamber on Thursday hosted its second annual State of the City and Small Business Showcase. The event coincided with the first Thursday celebration in downtown Canby and featured a sampling of local businesses and organizations, followed by Canby Mayor Brian Hodson's State of the City address. Mayor Hodson shared updates on many of the new developments, growth, and major civic projects that have happened over the past year. From Columbia Distributing's new facility and other additions to the KMB Pioneer Industrial Park, to the downtown core, and the important role it plays in local events and attracting new and unique businesses. Of Columbia, often a point of tension in Canby because of concerns about the traffic the large distribution facility may bring, Mayor Hodson had this to say. That's over 530,000 square foot facility coming into our industrial park. That's jobs. That's traffic. Yes, I'm not going to not deny that. But we've planned for that. We knew it was coming. We knew when we designed the industrial park that the intent was to draw businesses of this size. Mayor Hodson expounded on the importance of the industrial park to Canby's economic growth and development, providing a stable tax base and over a thousand local jobs. Canby Industrial Park is the economic engine to our city. We, I stated that 10 years ago when I got on the city council, eight years ago when I ran, and that is, an, that is the piece that drives our city. That's what enables us to do libraries and new police stations and streetscapes. That's what helps us fund and do a lot of the great things that we are doing. It's 350 acres. It was established in 1999 and it's only about halfway developed. And that's even with Columbia distributing in the project. To sum up the current state of the city, Mayor Hodson shared an interesting metaphor. Not necessarily a super flattering one, but if we're being honest, it's pretty accurate. I had a great conversation with a very dear friend of mine. We liken Canby to being kind of a young teenager in terms of where we're at as a city. We have moments of brilliance and then some moments of being awkward. Um, we have growing pains and at the same time we must adjust to our ever-changing person and being. Bigger hands, bigger feet, being clumsy. Um, we have had times of growth spurts and times of adjusting to that growth. And right now we are experiencing another growth spurt. The time is coming where we will have to adjust to the new us. And during that time of adjustment, we must once again roll up our shirt sleeves, come together and determine if we're going to plan and manage the next couple of stages of growth or wait and be acted upon and then react. But as he has in previous years, Mayor Hodson also addressed the question of whether Canby can preserve its current small town feel in the midst of big city growth. His answer was the same. Yes, it can. Whether it will, he says, is up to us. I will hold to the very last day that, that you all choose me to be your mayor, that Canby stays small because of the people that choose to come to our events, that choose to shop here in our shop here in our town, and those that choose to give their new neighbor a welcome of saying, hi, welcome to Canby. Because that's what it takes to be a small town. It's not the buildings, it's not the roads, it's us being able to go to our new neighbors that just moved in from Portland or gas. Yes. California <laughs> and say welcome to Canby. Though Canby Area Chamber Director Kyle Lang joked that he was offered a lot of money to do so, he declined to tear up Mayor Hodson's speech following his remarks. To hear the mayor's complete State of the City address, check out the bonus episode in the Canby Now podcast pod stream.
Those words from Canby State Representative and House Republican leader Christine Drazen at a rally on the steps of the Oregon State Capitol this week, with thousands turning out to protest the latest cap-and-trade measure favored by the Democratic majority in the legislature. Miles-long convoys of tractor-trailers from all around the state converged on the Capitol and Oregon State Fairgrounds Thursday for a rally organized by Timber Unity. The new cap-and-trade bill, SB 1530, would eliminate carbon emissions in Oregon, make a number of changes on how greenhouse gases in the state are regulated and taxed, and potentially phase out old diesel engines currently in use, forcing business owners to buy new ones. It was a diverse mix on the roads and sidewalks this week. Not only semi-trucks, some loaded with timber, but also tractors, representing the agricultural interests and small farms who also oppose cap-and-trade. On foot, the crowd was men and women, young and old, including children. Many wore truckers' caps and brightly colored orange or yellow safety vests. Camouflage and flannel were also very popular. Even Mario made an appearance, while on the other side of the aisle, a person dressed as the Lorax from Dr. Seuss's children's book was seen wandering the halls of the House and Senate, handing out candy bars that read, Clear Cutting Causes Climate Change. There were plenty of signs outside as well, with slogans such as, Recall Kate Brown, Trump 2020, Save Oregon, This is Our State, Kate, Stop the Climate Change Commies, and a couple others that we can't read to you because this is a family-friendly podcast. Timber Unity organizers hoped to draw attention to how the proposed legislation will affect small business owners, especially rural companies. There is widespread fear among the group and its supporters that cap-and-trade would put the timber industry out of business and impact thousands of working families throughout Oregon and to demonstrate they were not just about noise and bluster, and to show that they too care about reducing the impact of logging on the environment, the Timber Unity Group presented their own four-point carbon reduction plan, which they believe will effectively reach the same goals as cap and trade without levying new taxes or killing jobs in rural Oregon. You can find a link to that on our website, cambynowpod.com, along with lots of photos from our own Tyler Frankie. Oh, and the final counts from Thursday's event? According to Timber Unity, there were over 1,100 trucks, a Guinness World Record, and 10,000 protesters in attendance. It was a busy night for Canby Fire District as units were called to the scenes of two multiple vehicle crashes within 60 minutes of each other on a rainy Friday evening. The first occurred on Highway 99E near the Wild Hair Saloon at approximately 6.45 p.m. Canby Fire Division Chief Matt English said two vehicles were involved and two patients were transported to an area medical center with non-traumatic injuries. Just about an hour later, at approximately 7.45 p.m., another two-vehicle collision happened at the intersection of Canby Marquam Highway, Highway 170, and Centennial Lane south of town, near Cracksburger Road. In this case, a minor was transported for evaluation. English said their injuries were also non-traumatic. CFD advises motorists to drive the posted speed or slower when conditions add to a potentially dangerous commute and to watch oncoming traffic very closely. After two and a half weeks at OHSU in Portland, the driver in a suspected alcohol-involved fatal crash has been released from the hospital. 
Kelsey Martin, 29, of Beaver Creek, was transported by Life Flight helicopter in the early morning hours of January 22nd. Following a two-car collision on the Hubbard Cutoff Road, Highway 551, near Aurora State Airport that killed 33-year-old Stephanie Patricio, a longtime Portland comedian and Woodburn resident. Martin sustained serious injuries in the crash, but her condition was upgraded to good last week, and she has been released from care as of Sunday, according to the OHSU media relations team. According to Oregon State Police at the time of the crash, alcohol impairment on Martin's part was believed to have been a factor, but law enforcement have declined to release further information in the subsequent weeks, citing the continuing investigation. No warrants have been issued or new charges filed against Martin, according to the online court records, and she is not listed as being in custody at the Clackamas County Jail. She does face charges of a DUI, reckless driving, and fourth-degree assault in an unrelated case from December 2019. The next hearing in that case is scheduled for March 2nd. Reached last week, Clackamas County Chief Deputy District Attorney Chris Owen said his office was, quote, actively reviewing this case, but certain aspects of the OSP investigation are not complete. We can't release any additional information as it is a pending case, and we are prohibited from really getting into a lot of detail about a case when it is being considered for charges, Owen said. He went on to say that generally speaking, the investigation of a vehicular crime such as this one would involve crash reconstruction results, toxicology results, medical records, and reports detailing witness statements and physical evidence collected during the course of the investigation. Once the police investigation is complete, the district attorney's office would review the evidence and determine what charges, if any, they believe could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. The case would then be presented to a grand jury who would consider whether to indict or charge the defendant. Camby Now Sports is brought to you by Reif and Hunziker, PC. When you need an attorney, turn to the firm Camby is trusted for over 50 years. Call them today at 503-266-3456. Our congratulations to the seven amazing Canby High School student-athletes who participated in a National Signing Day ceremony on Wednesday, committing to continue their athletic careers at the next level. Participating were Caden Dowlager, signing for baseball at Lynn Benton, Haley Adair, soccer, Oregon Tech, Katie Mole, another Oregon Tech owl, but for track and field, Amy O'Dell, yet another techie for academics and track and field. Erica Evans, a key member of Canby's third place state championship volleyball team, signing with Lynn Benton. Bryant Rayburn, signing for baseball, Chemeketa Community College. And Josh Oakley, also baseball, at Linfield College. Two others, Ruby Kaiser, Colorado State Volleyball, and Marin Chard, Idaho, swimming, committed during the early signing period last December. Our congratulations to the students, their families, as well as to the Owls, Wildcats, Storm, Vandals, Roadrunners, and Rams. You got some good ones, but you know what they say, once a cougar, always a cougar. Hey, speaking of cougars, the OSAA North Regional Tournament for High School Women Wrestlers was held this weekend and Canby Wrestling sent eight hopefuls. Marisol Roseles Malagon, Nancy Garcia, Bella Flores, Elsie Cobori Rubias, Martha Perez, Javi Eric, Lexa Zoriaga, and Yared Calderon. All performed well in a sport that is relatively new to them. The highest finishers were a fifth place by Eric and a sixth place by Calderon, who made both of it to consolation rounds of their respective brackets in their first ever regional tournament appearances. In men's wrestling last week, Camby defeated Tualatin handily by a final score of 47 to 23. Top performers included Landon Sprague, Ethan Ensrud, Asher Chafee, Tate Letter, and Caden McCollin who all won by pin. 
In basketball, the ladies kicked off their week with an impressive win over number 7th ranked St. Mary's Academy, whom they defeated on the road 49 to 41. They followed that with another road win over the struggling Tiger to Tigers 51 40. The ladies have now won three straight. They're 5 3 in the Three Rivers League and climbing in their state rankings as the second half of the league schedule looms. Up this week will be 10 8 Lake Ridge at home and a grudge match against number six Oregon City on the road. The Lady Cougs upset the Pioneers in their first showdown 50 44, and Oregon City will no doubt be looking for some payback. The men had only one game this week, a rematch against Tiger at home, which they narrowly lost despite some more late-game heroics from junior point guard Diego Arredondo. Diego, who was on fire all night, hit the fadeaway jumper to give the Cougs a 56-45 advantage with 25 seconds left to play. But the Tigers answered back with a score-off and inbounds play and took the game 47-46. The Cougs, who've lost four in a row, will have to look to turn things around this week with rematches against Lake Ridge and Oregon City, both teams they have already beaten once this season. Hey, Tyler, I have to tell you about something. All right. This buddy of mine was telling me his internet bill went up right after the holidays. Can you believe it? I'm sorry, what? I know. Talk about a Grinch move, am I right? Why would their bill go up at that time of year, Frankie? Well, they said it was because of overage fees from going over their data cap. Probably because they had family home for the holidays with way more people than usual using their Wi-Fi. Think about it. You've got kids playing games online, parents streaming TV shows and movies, plus all of the devices everyone has that are connected to the Wi-Fi network. That's a lot of stuff using up data, and they were charged extra for it. That's super weird. I didn't even know there were like actual things called data caps for internet providers. I use a ton of data every month right here in the studio. And I've never seen an extra fee. Yeah, that's because we have direct link. With them, not only will we never be charged extra fees for using lots of data at any speed, but they also never slow down our internet speed for high usage. It's all part of their commitment to unlimited internet. Oh, that's right. That's right. Well, hey, it, I mean, it sounds like your friend should switch over to direct link. Yeah, no kidding. We would like to extend our undying gratitude to the Cambie Now Plus member, Maris Morrow. You guys are really throwing some crazy names at me. <laughs> I know they're not actually crazy. I'm just bad at names. We do, though, rely on your monthly contributions to continue to do this work that we love. To find out how you can become one of the coolest people in the world and one of the most patient because you put up with me, become one of our supporters on Patreon. Visit com backslash plus. All right, joining us for the Cami Conversation today is Nick Gitz, the owner of Swan Island Dahlias. Hi, Nick. Hi, good to have you here. Yeah, I'm back again, a little less windy than it was last time. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it is windy, yeah. we're just not out, right. out in the wind. Right, this time of year is better to be inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah but we are here on site at uh, the most beautiful place on earth, Dahlia capital of the planet, Swan Island here in Canby. Well, we think so. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you agree with that. And you were just saying, Nick, uh, for you, it's actually a little bit of a slower season, not necessarily slower for the uh, business in general. you got the catalog out. Folks are putting in their orders. You'll be shipping um, uh, bulbs for the uh, spring season here pretty quick. But for you, you've just, you're just back in a hammock. you got your feet up. <laughs> not so busy in the fields right, right now. Got, we're, all, we're done harvesting and everything's in the barns and warehouse now. But we do hire more people in the winter than we do in the summer. And oh, so, really? So they're all in the warehouse processing. Oh, sure, to, to uh, dig everything up. Yeah, right. to, when you, you have to cut them and divide them and sort them and get them ready for shipping. So there's... 
twice as many employees in the winter than there is in the summer. Yeah. So. Tell us a little bit, wait, this isn't really what we came here to talk about, but kind of how dahlias work. They're not grown from seed, right? They're grown from those tubers, from the bulbs? Well, for our business, it's generally they're grown from the tubers. You, uh-huh. you know, you plant one, it multiplies into a clump and you've harvested it and then okay. you cut them in pieces and sell the big ones and then plant little ones back again. And then, of course, during Dahlia Fest, you do sell the cut flowers. Yeah, cut the flowers is, yeah. is about uh, a little less than 10% of our business, mm-hmm. but... It's mainly tubers, but the yeah. cut flower business is, is big, keeps us busy in the summer. Right. But not, it's amazing. People think a lot of times that we're mainly cut flowers, but yeah. we're actually mainly tubers. Yeah, yeah, sure. So. I mean, obviously, just by nature of what they are, they're kind of that more visible, much more visible, visible a little bit sexier than dirty bulbs. But correct, <laughs> correct. It's a much prettier time of the year. Where, yeah, a little more enjoyable to see the new life and the new color every year fill the fields and stuff. So, but, um, and this kind of gets more into what we're going to talk about because you, congratulations, have recently won a major award. Um, but you, when you're kind of developing new blooms and, uh, doing that whole aspect, uh, you're more doing seeds. Is that right? Yeah. Seeds. It's, that's the fun part of, of Dahlia growing, I guess. And a lot of hobbyists can do it too, but, we're always uh, striving to create new top quality varieties. So, you know, when you have plant a tuber, or it's going to grow what you know it is. That tuber is going to stay true and grow that flower. But when you pick seed from, no matter what variety you pick seed from, you don't get that variety back again. Mm-hmm. You get a lot of characteristics of that one. Um, say if you're picking from a red dahlia, you might get a higher percentage of red than you do other colors. But a lot of times, you know, they, you get anything and everything, basically. And, and so we're doing... And it's uh, the, the bulbs are not like that. They're clones. So they the, stay. And okay. many times people wonder, well, they'll ask us like, well, you have them all in the field. They're all going to get cross-pollinated. They're right. all going to change. Yeah. The tuber doesn't change. Just the seeds. It's just the seeds. It, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun for me in hybridizing. I tried to learn basically from my dad, you know, over the years when then he passed away. So I kind of had to take it over. And, it, and is that just because it's sexual reproduction? It, you know, they get a little bit of the traits from different parents and that's right. where the pollination comes in. Yes, yeah, so a yeah. lot of people um, do a lot of hand pollinating, pollinating oh. to where they're out there with a, a Q-tip or a brush or a oh, finger no and doing that and then covering it with paper bags. Do you think that there's bees just sitting there like with their arms crossed, like they're taking our jobs? Like that's what we're, that's what we're here for. <laughs> Possibly, like, you know. So Shaking their heads well, like <laughs> these humans, they don't know what they're doing. So actually, you know, I, I do more of um, my record keeping is I know which varieties produce the better ones for me and I know which ones I want to cross them with so I will plant certain ones next to each other oh. but i but i really let the bees do most of the the work mm. or and i get the credit yeah <laughs> but a lot of the smaller growers that don't have uh room to plant say we you know we do 10 12 000 seedlings a year yeah. and so it takes quite a bit of an area and then i select just the very very few best ones out of that and plant the tubers again mm. and then we you know the first year from a clump you might get five six and you take those tubers and put it back, and you and you generally ninety nine point nine percent of the time get the same mm. quality back again. Yeah. And so after four or five years of multiplying them and weeding them down, so like if I select if I grew ten thousand seedlings, I might keep a hundred mm-hmm. that I'll dig up and keep those and and pl- replant. Yeah. And next year that hundred, I'll go through that hundred and say, okay, these fifty make the cut. Yeah. So we we'll, would we'll keep fifty. Yeah. And then I grow those the next the third year, and maybe I'm selecting thirty. Mm-hmm. And it usually gets down to where five years from when we started, we we introduce like ten. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's a lot of different um, qualities or of uh, way that Dahlia judges want them to look mm-hmm. the way the the shape of the bloom, the angle of the bloom, the distance of the bloom from the first set of leaves. Um, there's all different, there's all, <laughs> they're out there with like a ruler. Well, yeah. that's because people compete in shows sure, and sure. they have to meet these qualities to be judged high, highly to win awards at shows. Yeah, so yeah, that's one thing that I don't mean to change the subject, but that's one thing that really fascinates, fascinates me about the county fair. When uh-huh. you see like the judges out there with the pig or the sheep or whatever, <laughs> and just that 
incredible depth of knowledge that to me I have like a tiny inch of right. but to them like there's a world of difference between the way this one is standing versus the way that one exactly. is standing or you know and you're saying the same kind same, of thing that same. to me is so fascinating that people can attain you know so much depth in a very specific well, niche oh exactly yeah. and and they to most people the prettiest one might not be the show winner because right. they go generally the judges are looking at shape and form and the, how far it curls back on the on the pedal or uh, back mm -hmm. on the stem. So there's a lot of quality of shape more than color. Yeah, you know, in in the Dahlia show. So it's it's hard because for me, we have done an awful lot of um, I hybridize and and we have a big cuff flower market. So I select a lot of ones that I really like their stem quality the the firmness of the bloom mm -hmm. and and the amount of bloom on the plant from so the show perspective so it, for 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 our gardening perspective yeah yeah whereas oh. a show flower one that scores extremely high in the show might be one that produces less blooms mm. gotcha. and has they like it so the bloom is really up out of the plant so it's easy to disbud right. and get the proper leaves so mm -hmm. you have a a gardening aspect which you know you grow them for gardening and growing to sell to consumers that might have the greatest color, but not have the the show the form that would win the show, but yet right. would outsell the one that will win the show. So you have people that are really into this as their major hobby. Right. And they want the show dahlias. And they want to buy the dahlias that are classified by the judges as the ones that are going to win the shows, not yeah, yeah. necessarily have their prettiest bloom on them. Right, right. Yeah, that is interesting where those kind of diverge, you know, as far as the marketability versus like where the, the expert judges and the folks that know everything there's to know about dahlias would say, no, this is actually a better right. flower, you know. Yeah. Well, we kind of teased it earlier, but again, congratulations. Uh, the American Dahlia Society recently awarded you and actually another candy grower uh, with something called the Daryl W. Hart Medal. It was um, your second year in a row and third overall, I believe. Tell us right. a little bit about the award for, for not maybe non-Dahlia uh, fans out there. <laughs> well, it, you know, we hybridize these, you know, the seedlings, and when you select and get down to the ones you think are really top-notch, um, you send them to trial gardens. There's eight trial gardens in North America, actually seven in the United States and one in Canada, mm -hmm. where actually we have one here right. at the farm that, yeah. the, that the Portland Dahlia Society manages. And so they, we, they plant them, and we have a specified area it, for them. Is that the same as the test garden? It, or, yeah, yeah, right. Okay, that I've seen. And, yeah, and yeah. so they manage it, and then their judges come – and and judge them and it's all done anonymously so they nobody's supposed to know who's are planted here oh, okay and there's no names on the dahlias we just number them and then they do all their voting yeah so there's like i said eight trail gardens and people send their top seedlings to these trial gardens and then the scores all get accumulated to the american dahlia society and the american dahlia society you know averages all the points yeah and the top top point getter in each there's like Ah, I don't have it in front of me. Like seven or eight classifications. You have the, mm. the giants, the mediums, okay, and the, and the smaller different categories, different categories yeah. or types of blooms. So you compete against the same style right. or type of uh, of dahlia. Right. And they select one one award for each size. Mm -hmm. So there's like you know, um, it's just. Are it's very hard to get. I mean, really, yeah. it's kind of unusual that Alan mm -hmm. Manuel here in town got one, and I've got one. So I mean, in the same year, you have. Out of like eight awards given in the nation, yeah. two of them are right here in Canby. Yeah, which to me though, um, it, it just kind of does reinforce that thing that gets said a lot, but they can be really is. It's on your sign out there. <laughs> Canby is the Dahlia capital so, of the world. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't know if anybody else is maybe is not as crazy as our family that <laughs> want to grow. Most most Dahlia growers, you know, do a, either a separate business or a backyard business or a second business. You know, they grow two, three acres and, and have a nice small uh, field to, to grow from or what, and a website and things. But uh, well, for we bought this farm in 1963 and it was the nation's largest at that time. And we've, yeah. we've expanded since then. And um, it does take a, a lot of work. Um, you need to have the special soil that Canby has for this sand yeah. to be able to grow this amount right. and still be able to dig in the winter. So yeah. the soil really 
really helps us. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that your phone that keeps going off? Yeah. <laughs> it's so <laughs> funny. It, it, somebody's it, wanting to get a hold of me. It went off the first time. And I was like, oh, shoot. You know, I should have told them to, uh, to silence this phone. But it, it's not going to, like, go, you know. I'm sure that that was the only time. And then it just gets It's <laughs> like know, every I second. Know. like. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so Alan Manuel um, is a local realtor, just kind of right. does this as a hobby. Yeah, he, he used so. to be involved in his family's nursery, then he went into realty, and his Not brother, sure. I think, still keeps the nursery. Yeah. But he's done, now he's a hobby. Yeah. Or, I mean, it was small business before, and now as a hobby, and he just started hybridizing a few years ago, and he's yeah. doing really well. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit more kind of about uh, this specific bloom that won uh, for you this year and kind of how you. Uh, hybridized it or or developed it well it's called my forever mm -hmm. and it's it's a water lily style which means they're flat and it, the petals kind of cut forward do you, do you name them once you see them or do you kind of uh just like you know kind of based off its parents or anything before it sort of blooms basically we normally don't name until well the weird part is that we all a lot of times don't even select them for sale until like a month before the festival. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. For, the ones we're sending to the trial garden go in the spring. So it, they need to be named in the spring. So yeah. we try to, because they'll always say, we need a name. We need a name. Right, we need a right, name. Right. So that's the hard part sometimes yeah. is sitting around, all of us sitting in the office trying to figure out, oh, God, you know, we've got to find a name that'll, that'll fit this or match this. Yeah. And uh, so it's, you, you know, just try to like, you know, find out the judge's names and just, you know, play to that. Like, you know, Judge, <laughs> judge Smith is the best. <laughs> this, this is our interview today. Yeah. Judge Smith is awesome. Well, a lot, of, a lot of times we have names that, you know, we'll go with the season. You know, we've done Solo, we've done Chewy, we've done, you know, the Star Wars a year, a couple of years ago. Right, we, right, right. Sometimes we just find things that kind of match with, what's you know up at that time right, right. um it, it, we you know years ago we've named you know desert storm for the i mean different things mm -hmm. come up uh but that's the hardest part sometimes is coming up with a name sometimes yeah. it's it's a cute little name um actually heather named this one my forever and yeah um it's you know, it's a gold color, a peachy gold color. And I know some people say it has like three colors in it. Uh, to me, it's just kind of a gold blend. But, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I thought it was a song, but uh, it looks like maybe there was a more recent pop song called My Forever, but it's I thought it was like a classic song. So, but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's just something that she kind of picked from I, the, the yeah. prettiness of it. Many times they have this list uh, they keep on the computer that somebody thinks of, well, that would be a cute name. Oh, so, okay. So we I, have this name of a list of a hundred names or whatever that they, okay, it's time to name us, pull it out. Is there anything in here that might fit that down? Yeah. And you know, it's just, that's the hard part. I, yeah. I, I hybridize them. I create them. I choose them. And then they right. have to name them. So. Yeah. Well, I told you last time we met that you need to call on the Cambinalia. But, uh, you, you didn't, well, we, do, you didn't we, do that yet. We did can be, a, we, we did, we did can be crazy this year. Oh, okay, great. A, for the, if you go, if for you go to the rodeo, the yeah, can, yeah. there's a can be crazy down section. there. So. Yeah, I said uh, by them one th one year by mistake. So anyway, <laughs> 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 love it. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is uh, is it one of the kind of larger blooms that you were talking it, about? It's middle size. Yeah. Um, it's about a six to seven inch bloom. It's just middle. I like it really well because it's a it's a shorter three three and a half. It's short, stocky one that doesn't require tight you know tying up or staking up. Uh, it's really got a strong plant, mm. um, and, it, and like I said, water lily has to cut forward, but this one they also have to have depth, so it cups forward but has the depth. Um, you know, and you just never know when you send them to the trial gardens whether yeah. judges are going to go it's okay, right. or some judges are going to go wow, right? Um, yeah, because sometimes it'll get. A huge score in New York where it in can be, mm. it's they say it's okay, yeah, yeah. or you send it Spokane is really high and Tacoma's low. Yeah, and they, yeah. they have a it's kind of hard to understand, but they have a uh, 85 out of 100 is passing. Mm. So if you get 85, it gets registered in the books. If it gets 83 or 82 or 80, it's not considered to be. They didn't have that system when I was in school. <laughs> so they put it in the book. So, you know, like on this one, it, it, you know, I got an 86 and an 87 and 88 and 90. So, I mean, it averaged 88 or something. So, yeah, it's, yeah. It would, so if you get a 90, it's like amazing. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. usually a really good day, you will hit 87, sometimes 88. Mm -hmm. But if, when you get anything in the 90s, it's just uh 
it's up there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's awesome. It, it's great to have such nationwide recognition focused on yeah. Cambian in two ways this year. So that's really cool. Yeah. I feel like Nick, you could just talk about dahlias like all day. Like, what, what, <laughs> what, what do you find so so fun and so rewarding about this this process? I assume it's not the awards. I'm sure the awards are great, but right. We a lot of the feedback we get from customers, especially in the summer when they're visiting the fields. That's it. It does your heart really good when you mm-hmm. have people that are just so thankful of what you do and what you open up to the public and they were yeah. able to come here and see this. Um, it's a neat business because of the year round cycle right now, like our greenhouse is just starting and we're doing cuttings. So now you've got two or three inches of green growth. So it's a, a new vibrant start to the year. So, you know, then you have the cuttings and then next, you know, later on you plant and then they grow yeah. and then you have new blooms you know, and then the, the course of frost comes along and you go, well, I'm tired anyway. Let them, <laughs> let them die back and we'll dig them. And so, uh-huh. you, so, you, so you, my job changes, you know, so much with the year. So I'm not doing the same thing all the time. Yeah. So. Yeah. It keeps things fresh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So um, obviously you guys are most known for the uh, Dahlia Festival that's coming mm-hmm. up in uh august uh well it's the last weekend in august and and first weekend in september uh definitely you know it's uh you guys are open year round you got the gift shop uh dahlias.com for uh spring spring catalog right and 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 blooms that you can website uh, check out in there if you want to do some planting this year but at the very least come out for the dahlia festival because it is absolutely unbelievable if you've never seen the fields in full bloom 40 acres of dahlias all different colors it just you have to just stop for a minute. Like even as you're driving in, like you yeah. just kind of, there are people pull over and just kind of stop. <laughs> it floors you. It's unbelievable. So. Yeah. Now the festival too is like most of it, many of our can be friends or something. I, I see it. I see it all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you forget, I says, have you ever gone to the, sh- the festival and seen the inside show? Yeah. And what inside show? Right. So right. we put 15,000 blooms indoors. Yeah, yeah. Professionally yeah. arranged. And that's, that's really quite a sight. Yeah. And yeah. So that's yeah. a lot of work goes into that. Yeah. 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 There's, um, you know, I felt like an idiot because for the longest time, I thought Swan Island Dallas was just like the kind of field that you can see from, from, uh, Holly Street. Oh, but oh, I don't yeah. even know if that's you guys. But yeah. There, yeah. A, we have a two acres, small, five acres out there. Yeah. yeah. Like a five acre. I, was, I thought that was like near the sign, um, you know, you right. could drive drive down the road to actually get to, to you guys. But yeah, I thought that was the day. So like, oh, I've seen it. You know, I've been on the ferry. Yeah. I've been down Holly <laughs> Street, you know, so I hadn't even seen the actual full outside oh, farm for right. a long time. But then, yeah, as you mentioned, it's been time. Cool. Well, Nick, thanks so much. Congratulations again. Thank really you. Really appreciate it. And uh, best of luck next year. Yeah, we'll try again. Thank you. I'm here with Derek Hill at Advantage Mortgage, and you had some advice you were wanting to put out there to prospective home buyers. Yeah, you know it's so crazy out there right now. the uh, The housing market is just blazing fast, especially in the first time home buyer range of prices. Oh, cool! So it's imperative that you find out all the the ins and outs. You know, how much can you afford? what's your payment range that you want to be in, what type of loan program you're qualified for, because there's a lot of no money down loan programs that are available, but they really might not be best for you. Um, in my experience, those those loans um, have an increased payment that if they had a little bit of money down, they wouldn't need. But the great thing about Canby is it's eligible for the USDA loan program, which is a no money down loan. But um, my point is, it's just super important to get it figured out before you start looking because I've seen customers go find the house they love they and they call me and they're like, you know, let's go, let's go. Right. And then by the time we get everything dialed in, which can be in four hours, yeah. that house is gone. Yeah. And so it's just way better. Uh, so I just want to make sure that consumers know, give us a call. Just give us, you know, let's meet, let's talk about it, let's get everything dialed in so that you know exactly what you're up against, and then you're ready. You can make that offer and kaflui, you know what I mean? Yeah. And people can find you on your website or just give you a call? Uh, yeah, they can go to findtheadvantage.com or call 266-5800, obviously 503 area code. Um, and we love to chit-chat, and we have, you know, eight or nine different loan officers here in the Canby office that would love to sit down with somebody and work with them. Cool. Thanks, Derek. Derek Hill, NMLS number 50183.
Advantage Mortgage, NMLS number 177059, equal housing opportunity. Joining us on the line now is one of our favorite people in the whole world, even though she's not from Canby. (laughs) <laughs> it's Shauna Casey of the Oregon Renaissance Fair. Hi, Shauna. Hi, Tyler. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Also doing well. Yeah, well, you must be doing well. You're not, like, at least frantically planning for a Renaissance Fair right at the moment, right? Uh, unlike <laughs> unlike the last time we talked. <laughs> <laughs> Always frantically planning for the Renaissance Fair. <laughs> oh, okay. That just is a year-round thing at this point. Mm-hmm. So remind us who you're with, because you obviously do the Oregon Renaissance Fair that is based um, here at the Clackamas County Fairgrounds in Canby for the past few years, but um, you do a number of other uh, fairs as well. You're actually based out of uh, Vancouver, Washington, I believe? Uh, a little bit higher up in the, in the Seattle area, but oh, okay. uh, close enough. Yeah, so <laughs> we're part it's of all, the, it's all uh, just Washington to me. organization. Hey, it's the Pacific Northwest, yeah. and that encompasses a really large area. Right. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so we started doing the Washington and it's on Renaissance Fair 10 years ago, and uh, a lot of Oregonians were coming up to Washington because we had camping and all this fun stuff, and they're, you know they basically convinced us to come to Oregon, and then and so we did that in 2016, and Canby has welcomed us. Thank you, Canby. Uh, no so, you problem. Know, it's just grown tremendously in the last few years. There's a lot of hunger for something like this, you know. So our nonprofit does uh, entertain, you know, entertaining events, but they're also historically accurate. There's a lot of historically accurate things from the Renaissance eras and like you know similar periods. And we and we bring that to the masses in a in a fun interactive way. So awesome, yeah. And um, you know, we were there at the Renaissance Fair last year. It was an awesome time. We were really delighted to be able to go. Um, glad you're doing it again this year. But it sounds like you're adding a, a f- at least one or two new components as well, which is kind of your your uh, approach. Yes to keep things fresh. So basically what we do every year is we've got two weekends and we theme them. So the themes this year, first weekend's a Ren Con cosplay mashup. So, you know, we love to see, we're, we're basically mashing up and inviting all cosplayers, LARPers, or anybody that just likes anything in that genre to come and dress up and maybe do a Renaissance twist. We've seen a lot of stuff, for example, Jedi Knights that, you know, look like knights of the round table of Jedi. Mm-hmm. Also, stormtroopers dressed like that. We've seen Deadpool come in full armor, red and black armor, you know what I mean? So, Oh, yeah, I saw Deadpool last like, year. Exactly. So, you know, they, they get involved. They have a lot of fun. Um, there, we, we see there's a lot of mix, you know. The, pe- the same people that love to go to cons and cons, but also turns out they like Ransom Fairs. Who knew? Right, right. <laughs> So that's our first weekend. We're going to open up with what I'm calling the biggest uh, costume party in the in org. So. Cool. Cool. Well, I uh, I'm really excited about it. when I first heard about it. It it struck me as a little like, uh, are you sure? Because one thing that I love so much about the Oregon Ren Fair is the. I mean, like you mentioned, you guys are an educational nonprofit. You put on a really fun event and a fun party, but it's really uh, the the historical accuracy of a lot of the uh, the crafters and the way that they did things uh, was what really kind of appealed to me. Just more from that um, educational perspective, even though I am my kids did have a blast out there but um right. so and then you kind of like okay so how does spider-man fit into that or whatever but <laughs> when you think about it, like you mentioned there's so much crossover in the audiences that are kind of into both this stuff and like you also mentioned they're there anyway like i said i saw deadpool last year there were kind of people that were having fun with that aspect anyway so why not lean into it Exactly. And you know what? So our, our cast and crew, though they are still all going to be fully, so let's say uh, our fair is a Scottish fair. So we have a Mary Queen of Scots and her court. So we're still going to have absolutely have that 100%. 
from us. We're just inviting all the patrons to come, you know, and if they're, they're always worried about, do I have to dress up? And, of course, you don't have to dress up, but this way, you know, if you want to come dressed as the witcher, right, you can. <laughs> right. And you can feel comfortable doing it. So right. that's kind of the inspiration. Is we're still always going to have that aspect of the storyline is in a time period. Our artisans are still going to be time period artisans. But we're inviting other genres to come. We don't, you know, because there's other events where they're very strict about it. Like, if you come there, you've got to be dressed, you know, you've got to have hand-stitched your own costume mm. and all that stuff. And, and, and we don't want to put that kind of pressure on the uh, on people. So we say, hey, you're going to see some historical stuff. We're going to have all that and jousting and all that. But definitely, if you want to come dressed as that whole we are totally cool with that. Cool, cool. That will be fun. I um, almost feel like my counterpart, Tyler, should should have been on this call because he is the, the con guy and the cosplay guy. Um, I think it's cool, but he gets way more into it than I do. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, next time, hopefully, we'll get we'll have them on. Here next too. time, we'll do, we'll do a conference call. So, what's the theme for uh, week two going to be? Last year was pirates. Mm-hmm. Yes, so we choose called Whimsical Wanderlust, and it is a, basically a celebration, and it's dedicated to all things mystical and fantastical. Hmm. So, you know, fairies and dragons and goblins and everything in between, it, and this is a weekend dedicated to that. So it'll be a lot of fairies will be walking, running around and doing fun stuff, and I think they're going to do like a, a silly tea party, and there's just a whole bunch of stuff associated with that yeah. weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I think that's the one my daughter's going to make me go to. <laughs> that's the one that all the little girls like. Cause it's it's, it's, it's going to be a very pretty and flowy weekend, as I call it. Lots of flowers and, and just, just fun, fantastical things. Yeah, yeah. I got to tell you a story. So last year, we spent, we were we were out at the fair probably for like six or seven hours, like my kids and me. We we just had a blast. We did everything. But pretty much the whole day, we're looking for the, uh, the, the fairies. We're looking for their little, like they had a tent or something. We were told, you know, we got to find it because my daughter, she's five, you know, she, it was like made for her. And we, <laughs> we just couldn't find it. And then like literally at the end of the day, like as we're leaving, like you know, like I assume it was by magic, like it kind of like appeared before us, and we we're just like, oh, there it is. So we we went and you know we, we were doing the crafts and things that they do. My son, who's two years younger, uh, is just done at that point. Like in the whole day, he he wouldn't do anything. Like he wouldn't get into the you know he didn't want to be knighted. He he's just more shy. You know he's at that age. Um, right. So I knew that he wasn't going to be into this fairy thing. So we just kind of left him on the wagon uh, by the side. You know, I checked on him every 20 minutes or so. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> but we, we kind of figured he wasn't going to be into this. And then after we, you know, spent some time with the fairies, the, the, the head of the fairies asked my daughter if she wanted to do a picture in their little fairy throne. And so we did that. Well, lo and behold, my son, he climbs out and he he wanted to take a picture with the fairy and he was totally flirting with her. I got this like amazing picture. I'll I'll send it to you um, offline. It's pretty cute. So I think that ended up actually being the highlight for him. So, was the fairies. That's so awesome. Hey, you know what? (laughs) The fairies are going to up their game this year. So definitely, definitely bring them back. Yeah. Cool. Well, and I hear that there's actually something in the works for you guys outside of that main um, two weekends that you do. And uh, tell us the dates for this year. June 6th and 7th and the 13th and 14th. Okay. So in June, we'll have the kind of those same two weekends for the Ren Fair. But yeah, September, new mm-hmm. feature, new entirely new festival and uh, quite a different thing as well, this Celtic Music Festival. Yes, it is a celebration of Celtic music and culture. And we've got an amazing lineup already of uh, musicians coming in. And so basically it's three days of exactly what it sounds like. There's, but there, there's going to be other stuff like whiskey tasting and weed tastings and all kinds of fun, like a whole kid area. I think a couple of clans are going to come just so they can showcase, you know, some of the culture. Um, so it's basically that. If it, just think music, food, and booze. And suffer kids, and that's basically the Oregon Celtic Festival. Wow, you had me at music, food, and booze. 
Right, exactly, right? So <laughs> no, that it's, sounds it's really in cool. the Canby Fairgrounds and stuff. We're here to have fun, and we're offering camping to patrons. So oh, it's cool. like, come on Friday and like kick it and party with us the entire weekend. That sounds great, yeah. So that's kind of the, the so we're renting out the whole fairgrounds this time. We're just, we rent out a portion of it for the Oregon uh, Ren Fair, but for the Chelsea Festival, we're going to take advantage of the whole ground. So mm-hmm. there's going to be, I mean, you guys know it's a big, kind of a big spot. There's going to be lots to do from you know, every corner of that facility. Yeah. I, I am so excited about this. I love Celtic music, and it's not something um, that you can find very much in this area, especially not live. You know, occasionally you can find it in Portland or something like that, but um, I, I think this is fantastic that you're bringing this quality, and for three days, um, a, a festival just celebrating that very unique brand of music um, in here, right here in the heart of Canby. Yes, absolutely. And we're excited because we see that, you know, Oregon is one of those places that really is into the Celtic culture and music. And stuff. Oh, absolutely. You know, right, right there. But, you know, just like some of the pubs and things within, you know, 10, 20 miles from Canby, there's a lot of little pubs and, and Irish pubs and things like that. So I'm pretty excited because I think we've hit the right market. I think we're in the right spot and we've got some excellent like I said, our lineup is incredible. We got lucky to get some of the people that we've got. And so, yes, very excited. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Well, Shauna, thank you so much for taking time out to tell us all about the new things coming. We will have you back on closer to the Ren Fair like we did last year, um, if we can get a hold mm-hmm. of you. But um, yeah, yeah uh, we're, we're excited about even more uh, Ren Fair folks in our lives this year here in Canby. And hey, we are so thankful again and appreciate all the Can Be people for accepting us and uh, letting us continue to come back there year after year. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You want to shout out the uh, website where folks can find information or I don't know if tickets are on sale yet. Um, and I think there's yes. a different one for the Celtic Festival. Super easy names. Tickets are on sale for both. Uh, we've got the Oregon Fair. That's with an E, so F A I R E, OregonFair.com. Okay. And then it's O R Celtic Fest.com for the other. O R Celtic Fest.com takes you to the Celtic Festival website. Awesome. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you, Tyler. Like, once again. <laughs> Welcome to the Canby Now Community Board, where you're in charge. That's right, this is where we share your news with our listeners. Everything from birth announcements, birthdays, and obituaries to local events and accomplishments. If your hashtag can be proud, let us celebrate with you. Canby residents Jerry Bissett and Brenda Hedge Biden Bissett celebrated their 24th wedding anniversary and 28th year together last week. Congratulations! The couple got hitched on February 3, 1996 at the Clackamas Christian Center in Milwaukee in the middle of an ice storm. Brenda says the roads were icy and in such bad shape the state closed down I-5. Of the 300 guests who RSVP'd, about 200 braved the weather anyway. The next day, the newlyweds were on one of the only planes that managed to make it out of PDX for their honeymoon and only after the pilot had to de-ice the plane three times. I thought we were going to die, Brenda recalled with a laugh. From the warmth of Cabo St. Lucas, the couple watched CNN reports of the Willamette River's flooding back home. Their home, which was in Milwaukee at the time, survived, but barely. Our backyard was very, very soggy, Brenda said. Still, the couple looks back fondly on the memories, especially their wedding day, and all their friends and family who braved a blizzard to show their love and support. We thought to ourselves, if we can make it through this storm, we can make it through any storm, Brenda says, and we have definitely had some pretty serious storms. Clackamas Community College's Associated Student Government is holding a healthy living there as part of its Wellness Week this Wednesday, February 12th, from 11.30 to 1.30 p.m. on the Oregon City campus. 
The Healthy Living Fair aims to engage students and staff with health-related information and provide health and wellness resources from the community. Past health fairs have featured local fitness centers, nutrition and supplement vendors, medical professionals, health coaches, massage therapists, and naturopaths. Support local health and wellness vendors and get resources for a healthy lifestyle at this free public event. For questions, call Michelle Baker at 503-594-3041 or email mbaker at clackamas.edu. Hey ladies, are you looking for your mom tribe? If so, we have just the ticket. Check out the Moms Club of Canby, a fun and active group of local moms, a great source for playgroups, park days, local events, friendship, and fun. The club meets monthly on the second Friday and holds an open gym on third Thursdays. For more information about times and location, check them out on Facebook at Moms Club of Canby or email momsclubcanby at gmail.com. The Canby Aurora VFW Post 6057 and Auxiliary invites you to join them on February 22nd for their annual Iwo Jima flag raising ceremony this year planned for the Ackerman Center Gymnasium. All military veterans and their families in particular are encouraged to attend. It's the 75th anniversary of the flag raising at Iwo Jima and the 25th anniversary of the Canby event. Veteran groups and service organizations are welcome to participate in the massing of the colors to kick off the event. If interested, contact Martin Lackner at 503-849-8390. The ceremony itself starts at 10 a.m. Refreshments will be provided and we're told there will also be a drawing for a 68 Cadillac. To get your event announcement or community news on the Canby Now Community Board, email us today at info at canbynowpod.com. Hey, Tyler. So it's February, and you you know what that means. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. a certain feeling in the air. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. see what you're saying. Yeah. Tax Valentine. time. What? Valentine's? No, I was saying tax day is coming up for when you file. Oh, uh, but it's it's also Valentine's, you you know. Oh, man. Um, you know, I might need to call my wife real quick. I, I might be in trouble. Okay, well, if you're looking for some place to have a fun date night, you can always try the Wild Hair Saloon where Camby goes to eat and have fun. They've been in business for over 16 years, serve a fresh, locally sourced menu, and donate over $20,000 to Canby Sports and other causes each year. Check them out just off of Highway 99E next to Space Age in Canby at 1656 Beaver Creek Road in Oregon City, or just go to their website, thewildhairsaloon.net. Hey, hey, honey. So good news, bad news. Uh, good news, we got our taxes filed early this year. The Canby Now podcast is produced by me, Tyler Clausen. Our content director and star reporter is Tyler Frankie. We also feature the vocal talents of Joy Struby and James Walden. So round of applause to them. The song that you're hearing right now is Canby by singer-songwriter Olivia Harms, used with her permission. Find more of her work at olivia13.com. The Canby Now podcast is dedicated to preserving independent local journalism and redefining local news with our fun, fresh, and energetic brand of storytelling. Our sincere thanks to our local sponsors who make this show possible. Please show your appreciation by supporting the small businesses who support us. The Canby Now podcast is a production of Now Hear This Studios, Canby's locally owned full-service audio, video, and media production company. Our mission is to produce the best content in the universe. And we'd love to help you do it. Find us online at nhtstudios.com. Um, I will take a motion to adjourn. I just moved it. I didn't even ask for it, though.